colleagues talk about my book and tell me it's six pounds. They don't tell me how many pages there are. They probably didn't read it, but they tell me it's very heavy. And, and I'm very fortunate because it's also been translated into Japanese and Chinese. Again, uh, of course I can read it, but I'm very pleased that it passed out of my public contribution. Talking about modern architecture, I think Richard reminded me what he did with the students is looking at it in a very general, universal sense. And Richard referred back to the World Heritage uh, Convention as an example. And the reason we did that is because it doesn't put a timeline on it. Because if you look at the classical preservation in America, we're really talking about either 30 or 50 years. And we really wanted to look at the value of the heritage as a major example. But before that, I'd like to explain to you what Del Camal was. So it's a very funky name, nobody really remembers, but kind of, sort of, maybe always knows what it's about. It means documentation and conservation of the monuments and sites of the, of the modern movement. It started in the Netherlands in the, early 90s, in the early 90s, trying to preserve particular buildings that were actually from the interwar period, so not between World War I and World War II, and I'll show you one of the examples. Right now, uh, we have about 60 countries, and uh, in all the five continents. And I'm the president of the Okinawa US, which is a 501c3, and it's one of those chapters. And what you can see on the map is this is just looking at the Americas. The, the dots are places where there are the Okinawa uh, uh, chapters. And I, I think it's interesting to look at it because it shows you the interest there is in, in taking care, dealing with the heritage that is really very modern. So it's not just a localized interest, it really is part of what's happening in most of the sections of the world where architects and designers and uh, people interested in design and architecture begin to look at what to do with these buildings that really are very significant in, in time and terms of where they come from. So Docomo US is the 51C3. They are so have 17 chapters, and uh, we have five what we call friends organizations, which are groups of people interested in a particular community where we really feel there's no use for us to have a chapter, but still we would like the affiliation, and they would like the affiliation, looking at a broader scale, looking at the, the, the other things that other people are doing. And the map on the day is actually out of date. As you can see, Indiana is listed as in formation. And of course, uh, in the last couple of weeks, uh, Indiana, uh, Indiana Lambert is one of our friends groups, again, as a part of the expansion of the network of people and, and organizations working together for uh, modern architecture. What I do is I talk a lot. And not only do I teach, I also preach a lot. And I'm very glad there is an active sound installation here so I can really make my voice much more heard. Um, and I come into churches, and this is a, I'm, I'm lecturing here and talking, is the first science, uh, Christian science in Houston, where we had our conference, national conference uh, a couple of months ago. We would, where we, again, bring people together to talk about how we deal with a very significant modern heritage that we all know about, but really have not had a good direction as to what to deal with it. One of the other things we do is we have a divorce program. Because part of what is bringing the education and the appreciation back is also highlighting those things that we think are good. And so this year we did, for the first time, we did an awards program looking at American projects. And of course, there were some obvious ones in there, but there are also ones in there that because of their, let's say, modesty, lack of a better word, they're really intervening into an existing building in a way that was supportive of the existing building and really brought out of very good character. And we do tours. But tours to us is, uh, and I, I, I guess I talk from personal experience, I go on tours to places I can get into. Because that's the only way I can see all the things that otherwise are not accessible. And here you'll see a group of people on top of Albert Altos uh, Baker House in uh, MIT in, in Boston, where they get a tour from the architect to get to restoration and look and talk about what is happening behind the scenes. So it's not just a superficial tour with really very spe specific program as to um, what this is all about. 
So the question is, what's heritage? What, what does it really mean? Uh, what, what kind of, what does this word mean? You know, I, I like to begin at the beginning. I'm Dutch. Yeah. And the one on the, on, the, on the right side is the, the canal I grew up in. And as you can see, they had sort of foundation problems even in the 13th century. And it's the old church. The one on the left side is the new church. So here we have old versus new, except one is 13, the other one is 14th century. So even old and new is very, it's a very fungible concept. It depends on which side of the fence you're in. The interesting part is now you imagine me, I graduated from architectural school and I went to America. So what did they do on my first field trip? They took me to look at a church in Newburgh, New York, and said to me, this is a very old church. It was 1830. And they said, it looks Dutch. I don't know, classically me. There's nothing Dutch about it. <laughs> so here, there was my perception of what was old, and what their perception of what was old. It's really a matter as to where you are in how you think about this. And I think that's really part of the lesson that comes back when you look at modern architecture is it's not about age, it's about value, it's about significance. And so clearly the church on the left has a great deal of significance within the community or in the architectural history or whatever significance you want to attach to it. It wasn't just about age. But it gets better. When you look at the, on the slide, you see what really, let's say, 70, 60% of Netherlands is below the sea with the water table. And so the interesting part is here, there's this management model called the polder model. And polder, of course, is the Dutch word for reclaimed land. But it means you have to agree to something collectively in order to do something. Because you can imagine, if your neighbor doesn't maintain his dike, it doesn't really matter that you may maintain the dike, you're still going to get flooded. So very early on in the 13th century, they decided we've got work to do. And so it's the same process, by the way, to fire the Mississippi Valley in the early part of the 19th century, where the Creole sugar plants got together and did an annual inspection of the dike because obviously their sugar would grow the guy who put in his job. So clearly there is a way of community planning and involvement that has a degree of self-interest. But I want to bring back to this perception of heritage. This is the image I got from a friend of mine in Atlanta. And he thought it was totally appropriate because, one, it had a windmill, and two, it was thrifty. So again, the perceptions of what cultures are all about is really very much bound as to where you are and where you're coming from. I mean, well, there's a lesson here when we make judgments and make values and, and significance, it's very important to begin to look at what, where it's coming from and how. I think that, and I, I really don't want to talk about architectural history, but I want to sort of put out sort of thoughts here in terms of how this all fits together. And the question then becomes, what are those influences that we all talk about and that I'm sure it also came up in the Wies uh, Symposium that happened uh, something a couple of weeks ago? And I think there are very obvious sources. There are very obvious sources that anybody talks about. It's the Bauhaus and, and that's how uh, Walter Cropius in the mid-1920s. But again, if you look at it, if you look at it, you look at the curtain wall. That curtain wall is an East German aluminum construction of the mid-1970s. So again, we're looking at something to give value to and to make it significant, but it actually is a reconstruction, actually a pretty decent reconstruction of something that disappeared. So again, in how we make our judgments, you have to be very careful as to what we're looking at. But if the Bauhaus is that one part, then I would think in talking about, particularly in Columbus or in the Midwest, about significance of modern architecture, there's sort of two influences in, in a very general sense that you can talk about. You can talk about the Museum of Modern Art, uh, MoMA in New York, and we're looking here on the, on the sculpture card out from the, the new town of Gucci building. It's sort of one strain of modernism. But I think that for what we are talking about here, the other one, much of discussion about that, of course, is Cranbrook. And really what happens in Cranbrook, and obviously a lot of the architects and designers working in Columbus have very clear affiliations with Cranbrook, either through the family or study or whatever reasons they are, so they're very much into part of that department. But if we are talking about it today, we also need to talk about popular culture. 
<laughs> and when look at what's happened, well, again, when I started talking about this 20 years ago, I did not get 50 people in the room. And so you can see that the popular perception of this has really changed. By the way, I've never watched this show, so I'm not very keen on this, but uh, uh, clearly from the visual point of view, there was a great deal of interest that helps to foster interest in many different ways. But I think that preservation or conservation of modern heritage is becoming very much a worldwide exercise. And I'm only going to show you two examples that I think in their own way are exemplary for two different reasons. And what I'm showing you here is a aerial photograph of a TV sanatorium, about 1930. And the three was really a reminder because TV, of course, made Chicago deaths in, up until the 1950s in both America and elsewhere in Europe. So it really was very much part of it. And so they designed, this is the Diamond Workers Union in Amsterdam, designed this building for their workers. So there's this other part of what I would say modernism is a social, collective, um, public health issue to it, which part of has to do with the transparency, you know, uh, part of the glass, whatever else it has to do with. So it's more than just aesthetics. I think that's part of what I try to convey to my students is that it's not just aesthetics, it's also about the value of architecture to us as a community, and it's the kind of reason why I ultimately actually uh, broke a moment got started. Uh, the people that started were two years ahead of me in architectural school and felt there was a need to come back to some core values in terms of architecture. The building is very simple. Uh, you can see it's utterly transparent. Uh, this has been restored. Uh, it took about 10 years to come to this point. It was built as a sanatorium. For a while it was in the hospital. And now it's, it's a medical facility, an ambulatory facility that, that the building can accommodate without major changes. And again, that's something I want to come back to because it's one of the other arguments we were very often well see. And it's quite beautiful, it's very simple. And, uh, in many ways, that of course also presents different problems because you can hide anything. So the low line, very clear, uh, both in the design and the restoration. The other one I want to show you is um, the Alto Library in Viberg, or Victory, whichever way uh, you want to talk about. It's mid-1930s. It was built originally in Finland. Of course, now it's Russia as a result of the changes of World War II. And it's a collective project between the Finns and the Russians. And what's interesting about it is the impeccable research that was being done in terms of the Finns driving it, because Aalto is a Finnish hero like Sibelius and others, but also in terms of how they managed work with the, with the Russians. What's interesting about it, it also shows you how the limitations are. Because Alto did this when he was just out of school and he wanted as a competition. He didn't have much other work. He went to the site in the summer, and of course, he changed things. Like any good architect, you look at it, you don't like it, you change it. And of course, there's no documentation because he was there. So you see that from a restoration point of view, it would present a different kind of issues because of him being present. This is the new uh, the, the main uh, library hall restored. Uh, it's probably the railing of that that you see on the stack is probably one of the most comfortable railings I've ever seen. You put your hand on it, it's really beautiful. Uh, it, it goes with you. The books aren't back yet, but uh, I'm sure that that will be coming shortly. So let's talk a couple of issues. I talk a little bit about misperceptions, or perceptions we have about heritage, perceptions we have about buildings. But I think that you can also do this talking about it in terms of modern architecture. For a very long time, there was this perception that it was bad. And I'm here using the quote of Charles Jenks, uh, talking about that modern architecture died in 1972. And the reason, of course, he's writing about it because uh, it's the time that Pruity got the project designed by uh, Yamasaki in St. Louis in the early 1950s was blown up. 
And again, this, to show us the part of the dilemma that we have seen in the last two decades is that the quality of the architecture is basically covered over by social policy. That's part of, it wasn't maybe not just Thomas Archie building, but he's not to blame for everything. So part of that, that, that stigma has taken a long time to deal with because so much of that reference has been there. Even Craig Ferguson, uh, he's Scottish, and he's talking here about Commonwealth. Commonwealth is one of the English new towns which were built as part of the reconstruction after World War II. And it is similar stigma as you will see in, uh, as we saw at Blue Eagle. And a couple of years ago, I was in Scotland and I said, oh, I don't see it. I was looking and said, why, it's bad. And so it was actually not as bad as I expected. It was very much of a period piece in terms of its architecture, in terms of its shopping. But again, there was this immediate reaction that it wasn't very good. And I think that's part of the dilemma that we have, still have to some extent, to overcome. The other discussion is what I would call craft versus machine. And it is going back to looking at a project like this. This is something I did some years ago, uh, the Tusted Terrace in, in Central Park, about 18, mid 1850s, early 1860s. There's no question that anybody around here uh, you and anyone else will say, this is all, this is important. And part of that comes back to what I would call the craft of making. You look at a sculpture like this, I don't remember the sculptor, but the, uh, the quality of the work, the carving, both in its, in its expression and in its detail, is to the extent that we all we can look at these, this carving, I can tell you, I'm a botanist, I can tell you the plants they were. And so there is a level of appreciation that is very different of how we could approach architecture, so modern architecture. So I can keep that in the back of your head as, to me, modern architecture is about the craft of design. It's not maybe not, not as much about the craft of making as it is about the craft of design, because at the end of the day, uh, it is really that machine phenomenon. And we've been doing this, we've been tinkering with this for a very long time. And Again, I just pick an example here of the Notre Dame of Paris. What Villa did was putting cast iron heads on these statues in, in the mid 19th century. So he was already beginning to come to a mechanical way of dealing with a significant object. And so the transition we're in is a very long transition, but I think that part of dealing with modern architecture. So I, I'm thinking back then to Columbus, there's nobody here would ever not argue that this is not a historic building. And there's an appreciation for the fact that it's old and has been built and has qualitative value in terms of its surface texture, whatever else it is, that you wouldn't necessarily find with a modern building. Which is why it's not entirely true. One of the most fascinating pieces I've worked on is the building where he has off. There is a man in the, in the, probably in the 50s or so, begins to make in his spare time towers using bed springs and broken crockery. Why it's interesting is also that from a preservation point of view, ultimately, in my theory, this gets rebuilt because the qualitative work of what was being done is such that there is no other way of keeping it by rebuilding it. So I think there's another part that we will see in the discussion is that part of the preservation of modern architecture is about scale, it's about time. At the end of the day, a cathedral will get to be built in 500 years or 1,000 years, whatever the time frame is. We do it in six months. And so basically, the time frame makes the valuable difference, but at the end of the day, the process and the outcome is this similar in the sense of not being entirely in I think that this discussion has come out, particularly in the last 10 years, at a an example as Lieber House. Building designed by Kurt Bunshoff of Salem in the early 1950s, and a curtain ball that failed from the very beginning. There, there, there's articles in the, in the paper about the thing leaks. At the end of the day, the whole curtain ball gets replaced. 
And here, the decision was made partially because of uh, pressure in the community to duplicate visually exactly what was there. Not, whole, not in terms of its makeup, but in terms of how it looks. And so here you can see there's a very clear distinction in, in what we have done before, is that we really go back to what was there. I want you to look at the picture on the right. And the picture on the right, because that is a photograph of our Park Avenue in the early 1950s. For us, it's very hard to realize what an incredibly stunning, incredibly challenging building it was when it was built, because everything around it was neoclassical or Italian Renaissance based in the apartment buildings. Today, there are so many other buildings next to it that have similar kind of curtain walls that we sometimes lose the fact that there are, these were very important buildings at the time. So they're significant, it's not only present, it's only there because of the earlier, uh, of the earlier impact. Part of this is in the discussion that we need to think about interior design. We're not there yet, but the profession of interior design as we know it today is essentially in post-war development. What we're looking at is the original Lieber headquarters, it's not there anymore, I took these pictures in the early 90s, uh, designed by Raymond Lowy. Raymond Lowy was an industrial designer, he made packages for Lieber, he didn't, he didn't have any interiors. So it's the transition of a new discipline and a new qualitative uh, part of the interior, which is actually still quite, uh, quite rich. I really like that ceiling with these very, very free form lids, but as I said, no, this is just a new The curtain wall failed in the beginning. Uh, you see on the left side what I used to see out of my office uh, in terms of what the curtain wall looks like because they replaced glass and broke and they kept going. And of course, it's like repainting a space, space you match it to what you had last, and of course, by the end, by the 10 times, you are totally all in color. And ultimately, what we did is they basically replaced the entire wall, and we designed it. And what you see in the, in the slide is on the left side, is existing on the right side, is the new one. If you look very closely at the detail, you will see that the depth of things have not changed. But visually seen from the outside, it is similar, but it actually isn't. Because this comes back to the discussion Lewis and I had just a few minutes ago, is that materiality has changed. The building was built on drawn sheet glass was the normal, normal product, which is slightly weighty. In the early, in the early in the late 1950s, uh, they came out with float glass, which is what you see here, which is absolutely perfect. So that the building is actually more perfect than it was before. So again, how close are we to the original is, you can argue about it, because clearly if we were able to compare it, we would see a great deal of difference. So again, you see how the criteria begin to change and uh, appreciation changes. And if you look at it today, uh, if you think back a few minutes ago about the other image, it looks very perfect, and it, it is very, uh, very beautiful. Like in other words, obsolescence. What makes modern buildings so different from before is that the typological precision by which they were designed is far more specific. In the Middle Ages, you had four building types. You had a church, you had a, a town hall, you had a house, and you had a, some sort of factory place or a storage place. So you really structurally, physically, technology-wise, are very much within a very strict tradition. If you look at, let's say, the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, where we begin to design buildings for a specific purpose, with that becomes, of course, the problem that if that purpose changed, that building needs to be adapted. And so part of what the discussion these days about modern buildings is about the fact they don't fit what it is there. And when we have new plants, or we have a new production process, or we have new uh, philosophy about what the workplace looks like. And to some extent that's true. And I don't necessarily want to challenge it completely. But I want to challenge it on the basis of modesty. We think we know what's going to happen tomorrow. And we actually don't. And you know, the classic example to me is either airports. What we thought 20 years ago airports were all about has completely changed. And uh, or banks. Banks 
and, and varying branch banks have changed in the last 10 years and customer service is slowly coming back into the branch. So you can see that we have all these predictions, so that we have to be very careful when we do that. I've taken TWA as an example, and I won't go because again, the CERN connection back to Columbus, how interesting it is to see what we are doing. He designed it for TWI, but uh, the building was obsolete by the time it was finished. Because the introduction of jungle jets <coughs> made the capacity both the height of the gates and the size of the gates, as well as the number of seats in the gates. And then, of course, the luggage, because it, it makes a very big difference if you have 100 people or 300 people in the place, and you've got to accommodate them. So, then the building was in the very beginning obsolete, and the struggle ever since. The other interesting part is that the views originally were not very good. And so that the consensus that if you the problem you also look into when we do the preservation again, is that we look at reviews from the 1950s and the 1960s as criteria for acceptance. And we've got to be very careful with that because they were also written within their own context. And here's an example where the, the review was mixed. And for us, it would be no question that this uh, building was a very important building. This is on the construction. You see a very uh, thin kind of shell concrete roof that uh, Ammon and Whitney and Hero Siren were designed for the building. I've always wondered whether <laughs> you looked at this. I mean, I'm walking around in Palm Springs uh, a year ago and I lived in the back of the car. So the same design is setting where it's. Again, it may be a visual anomaly, but it's kind of interesting how you see the homogeneity of design at the period, which of course translates itself back into the building. This is the building where it looked in the early 1970s when you can still take photographs of airports without being arrested. And you see the original signage, which again is very glowing uh, for, a for a TWA. So it very clearly is an iconic building, and therefore, the preservation was possible because even then, when American Airlines took over at TWA, they closed the terminal a year earlier than they said they were going to do it. It's been empty ever since. It's been restored on the outside. But finding a purpose for it has been very difficult. And part of it is the, the issues of accessibility, of size, etc., etc. So the building uh, is still there, but pretty well obsolete. But you've got to admit, it's pretty, it's pretty stunning. This, again, is a photograph of the early 1970s. But all of that is still there. The unfortunate part of our preservation always is that Tito would hate never having the money to change it. Otherwise, they would have. <laughs> and so part of the, 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 the economic, economic problems of TWA are a blessing to us today. And of course, the relationship, again, talking about perceptions, the relationship between the higher side and the terminal. And you could look outside and you could see planes coming and going, which is part of the experience of an airport. And uh, certainly uh, what happens now is that you'll see in the back is the new terminal designed by Gensler, uh, accommodating uh, uh, JetBlue mostly. And of course that relationship between uh, the air side and the terminal has changed. This has been a 10 year battle I got involved in this in the ICOCCN probably 10 years ago. And we have made incremental changes to keeping things. The piers that were coming out where the gates were, we couldn't say, but we have the bridges to the connecting pieces that were connecting you back to the terminal. So again, parts of the salvage. And so in many ways, the National Trust and others see this as a, as a success story, and not entirely. Not entirely positive about that. Some you lose. And I think this is one of the most recent battles, of course, is the Brendan Women's Hospital. And Brent Goldberg was a very iconic architect. I mean, his, his corn cob buildings in Chicago clearly are very well accepted as a part of the residentials. When the building was built, it was actually uh, on the forefront of maternal, of the, uh, the maternity. Uh, treatment or, or processes. So in, in many ways, it was building was very well designed and programmed from the very beginning. 
But obviously, here is, and back to the obsolescence part, things change, and so that the adaptability, this is all poured in place concrete, and it's serious stuff here. So you couldn't really do much with it. The inflexibility of the building also made it very difficult for that. I'm not sure this is one of those images that appeared in the New York Times and uh, uh, your gang came up with it. When you, when you come to this point, I, I would agree to split all of this. <laughs> You're so far away from what the original intent was that make recorded, documented, but this is not the solution. So again, uh, in that sense, uh, I'm not advocating that, I forget advocating the chain of demolition, but this is where it's taking place now, it's being taken down, and it's one of the things that we can say. One of the interesting things is, I, I call the experience, the role of glass in our modern architecture. A little bit of reference to it earlier, we were talking about the TV center and the role of light in therapy in medical treatment, but also the role of glass in terms of inside versus outside. And it's one of the reasons why it makes heritage so different, because you cannot ignore the inside of you. If you have a sloppy inside, it's part of your outside. You can close the curtains occasionally, but basically the interior architecture is very much part of the exterior architecture. And so therefore, a lot of historicistic designations, where you can say, oh, as long as it's 18 inches away from the glass, it doesn't really matter because of the Victorian wall ratio between solid versus closest there. In modern architecture, you can. And I'm using the example of, of the bank on Washington Street. And I, I don't know the exact date, but I think it's about the same time as this one, which is Branch House uh, Manufacturers Hand of Trust of the early 1950s. What's interesting here, I want to get, take you through the sequence of what happened to it, because it begins to see and talk about the levels of intervention that we can do in architecture or should explore in architecture in order to find uses for it, ongoing uses for this building. Well, on the, imagine, this is on Fifth Avenue. It's a major shopping district. So therefore, a location like this is extremely valuable. Initially, is that the bank has its side entrance to 43rd Street because they wanted to show off the bank. They wanted to show off the bowls that you could see where your money was. And again, it's sort of very totally different from the 19th century bank, where of course you would have bars and granite blocks and rustication to suggest that it was safe. Here, it was about transparency, which is one of the reasons this bank and, of course, also the Saranen Bank are, are so significant because it's a totally different perception of what the bank is all about. You can also see that on the top floor where the workstations are, that those workstations are part of the exterior architecture. So you have to be very careful how you fill this in because you are affecting the overall perception of the building. This is what it looks like now, Joe Fresh. And the two things are significantly different. One is that they wanted an entrance on Fifth Avenue as a retailer on my entrance on the major street. And so there's this whole battle back and forth as to how far to go and how far the changes are. Ultimately, they got their, they got their, um, they got their entrance. The second part is night levels. And I think we, we, we're having, we don't talk yet enough about night levels. Our light levels are significantly higher than they've ever been before. And if you're a retailer and you need to see the merchandise, obviously you need, to, you need even more light. So that really part of the visual perception of the building is also the change of the light. The light intensity is different. So you can see the entrance. And this is what it looks like on the inside. And I'm not making a change. When they move the entrance to the bedroom, you also need to change uh, the uh, escalator. And so the whole experience of the building is different. Now, you can, we can argue about it different ways, and I've argued with my, my students about it in different ways, but they can look at a 90 degree change of escalator, but there was an escalator there, is very different. And as a result of that, you can barely see in the back corner there, there's a mobile design by Harry, Harry Bertoya 
that's where the Harrington Hill is based. It was actually designed to be on the top of the stair. So you would come up to it and you'd see uh, the, 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 the filling wheel of the, of, the, of the sculpture. And of course, that's what the Belgian was. Again, back to the, the interior. On the back, one of the big battles was the Victoria screen. Because it was a very long the screen designed by Harry Victoria that they actually took down. And part of the preservation battle was get this thing back. Because this screen was also visible from the outside. So it was part of the visual architecture of the banking hall. So it wasn't just a piece of sculpture. It was very much integrated into, this, into the architecture because behind there are the elevators that were the floor. So what my argument was coming back to is that design is a very critical part of the craft of architecture. And so therefore, part of our significance and how we look at it has to come back to the design, not just to the materiality or the romance of the making. And that doesn't mean there is no making involved. Of course, there is a great deal of making involved. And I'm just showing you some of the prototypes of the Eames uh, Charles and Ray Eames, on the, the left side was the, the splint they did working for the Navy, and of course the, on the right side are the chairs. So it's not that it's totally the void, but that the ultimate product is really the craft of design. And I want to bring it back to Columbus. I really like to be along Washington. And I like it because on the one hand it's a period piece as a piece of architecture, it's also a period piece in terms of preservation, because the interventions being done here by Alexander Girard are what we did in the 70s. And so in one way is this intersection between modern architecture, modern design, and, and old architecture is interesting in some way. And then of course, uh, on top of that is the, is the, is the intervention itself, the design, and of course, the interior furniture, again, very, very, very typical, very important as part of their period. Let me bring it back to Columbus. And I guess as an outsider, I cannot talk to any great detail about a lot of the specific history of buildings. But I think what, what's always struck me, and I'm sure that in the, the various nominations that it comes forward, is the history of the program itself, the program of designing these significant buildings over a long period of time. And I know that uh, Erwin Miller, Miller looked at the State Department as the starting point. Again, we come back to Saren. Saren was very much part of that. And uh, it will be very interesting. Columbia has got a whole series of meeting minutes of the Architectural Advisory Board meeting picking architects. And I'm looking forward to one day reading about how other architects pick architects. And I can't imagine it's going to be interesting. Um, but be that as it may, it is back to the fact that it was a program designed to showcase American design across the world. And it was a very careful selection process in order to make sure uh, that was being done. And of course, Sam and the, the, uh, the embassies in Oslo and the uh, Stockholm, perhaps in the Denmark, etc., uh, etc. Et so they're really very carefully showcasing that uh, architecture. The second part is that, uh, again, it's the Cranbrook connection. It's the Cranbrook connection between the selection. Because if you look at who did it, granted, we Khan got some work, as well got some, but really it was the, the, the group that was in Cranbrook in the late 1930s, early 1940s, that was doing this work. Of course, Harry Reese was part of that. And so it's really interesting to see how that vision of design, advocating for design on a global sense or in a community sense, was really what was struck and was the model for that. The second part is that I think as a result of that, the collection that you have, and I keep using this word, but like New York has MoMA, you have a collection of architecture. So you have another way of looking at it that nowhere else in the world or even in America you can find. So in itself, as a collection, talking, taking away from the individual buildings for a minute, I think is very, it's a very important piece of And so I put a couple of images there. 
in, in my mind, if you look at the qualitative where it is, is I think you look at what do we see as the monuments of architecture, and which, by the way, is probably every architectural student will to visit. I mean, uh, it does a lot. And like twice I was there in the 1970s when it looked like hell because it was really falling apart, and this is the more recent photograph. For Philip Johnson's class house, which is actually not a very good building. But uh, again, I call it in its cultural significance. And that's the kind of collection that I think we're talking about. And I think the, the reverence or the appreciation or the care that we have for that is what I would advocate uh, also for you. Farnsworth. Um, this is a photograph I took last year when they were doing repair work. It was a very iconic building. Uh, of course, it's been flooded uh, probably three, four, five times in different degrees. It needs a lot of work. Um, and then looking at this is what they're talking about now. This is what the United Plan, the National Trust, is about. Basically, to move the house further up the hill, build a concrete foundation, hydraulic elevation, and so put the house back so you can lift it up in the flood. Um, I'm, a, I'm the leaders in dikes, so I mean, I can't. <laughs> to me, you put a dike on, but you put it higher on the ground, and that's it. You put it the water's or. But whatever. So I think this is interesting how, but it's an example of how significant the building has been considered. I think that's sort of a, the, uh, or the Eames house. Uh, again, uh, again, an example, Charles and the Eames designed their house. It's been carefully restored with, uh, with guidance and spaghetti in terms of it. So. What I want to show you is this. There's a, there's a strain here that we haven't talked about, which is that hazardous materials. Materials that are very popular in one point. What you're looking at here is an asbestos cement pound. Asbestos, asbestos was used for everything from the late 19th century onwards. It didn't disappear out of our vocabulary until the early 1970s. So there's a lot of it around. Most of it's encapsulated in concrete or whatever else it is. But it's a reminder to us that whatever we do now, we should be very conscious as to the long-term impact. Because I think part of modern architecture will be we will be replacing some of that stuff because we cannot oversee what all of the uh, implications were. And so to, to close this off, I'm putting the Miller House. Because I think it, it, that's the kind of level I'm, collection I'm talking about. And while it may be less so known, certainly for its care, both in landscape, in terms of its interior or its exterior architecture, I think it has that significance. So sort of really, that is the kind of thing that I want you to think about when you are making your decisions or suggestions about architectural significance. And you know, as I said, I, I, I don't want to talk about Columbus per se, but I want to sort of put it in the context. I want to put it in the context of how significant an in interior or an exterior of a church, and that is in comparison to, for example, looking at some church architecture in Germany. Uh, in the late 1930s, which is similar to it. So they really clearly they were part of a very large group that wasn't isolated. And certainly church architecture in America and the post war period and the churches that you have here are very much part of an enormous openness in church design that we see across the country. And again, very, to which very little attention so far has been, has been paid. So I would argue that again, looking at these very carefully is very important because of their larger cultural context. So the opportunity, so how are people doing? So how are the people doing, reflecting this enormous significance of modern agriculture? There's the mission to modern public. The state of Michigan put money aside probably two or three years ago as part of economic development because clearly manufacturing jobs were not coming back. And they were looking at another part of the legacy to see which had a larger cultural impact. And you know, so they're talking about both the automobile industry and the furniture industry as being the two major forces of in Michigan. And in my conversation, I've always said to them, Americans have three major parts. It's their, their car, their house, and their furniture. Two of those are made in Michigan. 
So you can see the importance in that ecoic context. And so they're really working on that very well. Or what Palm Springs Modern does. Palm Springs is a community uh, close to Los Angeles, I think it's about two hours. And they started modernism. This year is the 10th time it happened. And it's a major boost to celebrate both of them their modern heritage, but also as part of what made uh, economic development sense in the context. And so again, the advantage is very close to Los Angeles, but so it's another form of taking, of taking the, the modern heritage further. And then Sarasota, uh, we were there at the Oklahoma uh, conference there last year, it was the beginning of Sarasota modernism. So again, they're beginning to pick up on that same theme within the Florida context because of their artificial heritage. LA, with help from Getty, does a very large cultural survey, which is really great. It's very comprehensive and very unique to us looking at those universities. I've talked about the awards programs. Uh, the World Monuments Fund, together with Noel, is, is, we're doing this for the fourth year. Uh, looking at heritage abroad. And what you see here is the call for, for the nominations for this year, uh, showing a school in Japan. And when we looked at this, I'm on the jury, uh, when we looked at this, um, one of the team school. If you're on the jury, you're picking a building that you've never seen. You're always very weary because you don't know what they're giving you. And so we actually asked someone to go there and look at it. And it's a very beautiful, very simple, modern addition to a, to a 1950s uh, Japanese school. And so that's still, that was still working last year. Modern is America, which is what we do. We brought up the series. And apropos that, we have a young professional group in Boston and in New York that calls themselves the modern way. And they go and look at something and then they have a judge. And there's nothing wrong with that. They're part of combining the social part with the architectural part. Of course, um, the, the collection of photo and images on the left, of course, is uh, Paul Rudolph, then the Eases, uh, Paul Johnson, Paul Harrison, of course, these are all of So all of the stars of modern architecture are uh, here. The only thing they do is a just a ball for Halloween. It's called the Corvo Ball. Of course, it's partially Halloween, partially takeoff on the project. And dress up as a very good old Beaux Arts tradition to dress up as your building. So on the left side, you see Frank Gehry's Fish House, and on the right side, of course, is the ATT building by Philip Johnson. And so, you, again, you can celebrate modern architecture, but also taking uh, 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 pleasure. Or, as I saw in Finland last year, uh, you turn to teach kids to the rules of the road in a little playground with a modern architecture around it. Of course, these are buildings that are unable to uh, scale down, but again, they will grow. So again, it's part of education, it's part of appreciation, and part of it out of property. So what I come back to is then perceptions of the future. What, what do we do? And as I said, I don't know. You know. The World's Fair was easy. You go in the circle, you look down, and it's all finished. And I don't know what it's going to be. But I would argue that, they even, or even I look at Disneyland in the early 1970s, the world wasn't going to look like that. But I think whatever it is, I would like to end with the motto that's at the library of Congress. Part of what we have in our heritage past is really to see what we 